Hey everyone, Sean here for Lambda School. And in this video, we're going to be talking about recursion. More specifically, we're going to learn how to identify when a problem can be solved with recursion. And then we're also going to talk about how to use recursion to then solve said problem. And this is probably not the first time that many of you have encountered a recursive code. I think it's probably safe to say that some of you or many of you have seen some recursive code uh, in your time here at Lambda School so far. And maybe up to this point, I would guess that most of you shy away from it because it seems very, it seems really weird. It seems really foreign. But what I'm going to say here is that recursion is actually a very handy tool for, for coming up with a first step for solving uh, certain algorithmic problems. So that's why we're introducing it here. Uh, but first off, let's, let's step back a bit and look at some examples of recursion in a non-programming context. Recursion shows up in a whole bunch of other places as well. And one of the cases that I think is really, really cool is in art. Uh, like in this example here, which I really like. Uh, but then also in those cases where I think um, many people have experienced this, where you walk into maybe like a room, uh, like a barber shop, as I think where this has mostly happened to me, and it's both, both sides of the walls have mirrors, right? And so when you look at one side, you see your reflection on the back side and it just reflects or recurses all the way back infinitely on both sides. So that's, you know, an ex another example of recursion in a non-programming context. Uh, and let's talk about a few more. So here, this is uh, the Sierpinski triangle. If you haven't heard of it before, uh, it might look very familiar to uh, the Triforce for all you Zelda nerds out there. But this is an example of a pattern, a mathematical pattern called uh, a fractal, where everything is kind of defined within itself and it just kind of keeps reflecting in and on, in on itself over and over and over again. Some other examples of fractals, by the way, are you know like like tree structures, or um, for example, if you look at like a, a stem of broccoli, that is. Uh, an, a, an example of a real world fractal because broccoli, if you keep slicing it up, you'll see that the smaller stems are also have the exact same shape as the larger stem from which you just cut it off from. And then of course, there's examples of recursion in math. Uh, one of the most identifiable or famous ones is the Fibonacci sequence of here, uh, here with which here's the formula, right? So again, some, the nth Fibonacci number in the Fibonacci sequence is simply defined as the sum of the two previous uh, values in the Fibonacci sequence. And then also uh, the zeroth Fibonacci number is defined as zero and the first Fibonacci number is defined as one. So we have these kind of seed values for the first two Fibonacci numbers. And then from there, we can go and construct every other Fibonacci number in the entire sequence, right? So any arbitrary Fibonacci number in the sequence, again, except for zero and one, are simply defined in terms of other numbers in the sequence. So now let's actually give an example or a, a definition of recursion. And for our particular case, we're going to have a pretty specific definition. You might have, have heard of this before. If you again, if you've seen recursive code before, but first off, the most important thing we're going to need for to implement recursion, I should say, is a base case or multiple base cases. And these are important because they specify when the recursion terminates. Right. So again, if we think back to the examples that we looked at before, uh, those didn't really have a those didn't really have a, a termination. Right. They just kind of seemed like they just kept on going. Same with the Sierpinski triangle uh, in the in the painting, as well as in the Sierpinski triangle. It just kind of looked like they just if you just if you think about it, they could just go on forever and ever and ever. But uh, that's not actually feasible for us when we're writing recursive code because recursive code has to stop. Otherwise, our machine is literally just going to keep running and running and running in an infinite loop, 
theoretically speaking. Actually, your machine would just run out of resources before that happened. But if your machine had infinite resources, even then it would just keep running over uh, forever and ever and ever. So we need a base case. We need a base case that says, all right, once we've hit this case, stop the recursion. And then secondly, uh, because we just said the base case is where we stop the recursion, the other very important thing we need in, in any recursive code we write is a rule or rules that reduce all other cases towards a base case. Or in simpler terms, basically, if we're not at the base case, here's a rule for how we actually get there. So if we follow that rule recursively over and over and over, eventually we have to get to the base case in order, you know, assuming, in order to write correct recursive code. Okay. So let's take a look and break down some recursive code. Here we have a recursive factorial function. Uh, and again, factorial just means given some integer n, we're going to multiply everything preceding that number all the way down to 1. So if it's factorial of 4, if n was 4, then we'd multiply 4 by 3 by 2 by 1, but not 0. Because if we multiply anything by 0, it'll just be 0. And then there was no point in doing the factorial. OK, so we can define this, this factorial function recursively, right? Because for any n, we just multiply it by the term before it, and we multiply that by the term before that, and then by the term before that, and so on and so forth. And in this case, then, uh, the base case is going to be once n hits 0. Because as I said earlier, we don't actually want to multiply by 0. Once we hit 0, we want to stop the factorial function there in order to get our final product. Again, we don't want to multiply by 0, because if we do that, then, um, then our, our whole, then we just get 0. OK, so this is going to be our base case. right? Logically speaking, once we just thought through what the factorial function was doing, we can kind of easily figure out and come up with, oh, we want to stop at this point. We don't want to go past this point. We don't want to multiply by 0, and we are not going to consider negative values either. Okay. So again, this function assumes that n is some positive integer. And then it's going to stop once n recurses down to 0. Okay. And so again, the other part then is we need to essentially move towards this base case of n equal to 0. And that's what this last line here does. Right. So. You note the recurse factorial function being called again, this time with n minus 1. OK, so if you think about it, uh, say if, again, we start off with n equal to 4. This code's going to run. It's going to check n. n is not going to be equal to 0 because at that point n is 4. So it's going to skip the base case. It's going to go on to the last line. And it's going to run that. So n is 4, so it's going to say 4 times recurse factorial n minus 1. So that's going to now, again, run this function with 3 now. So we're going to get another instance of this function. Another instance of this function is going to be called. This time, it's going to be recurse factorial n is going to be 3. And again, it's going to check if the base case is satisfied. It's not, so it's going to go and recurse again and call this function again now with 3 minus 1 for 2. And so that continues. So now recurse factorial is going to again be called with n equal to 2 now. It's going to check the base case. It's going to see that it doesn't, isn't satisfied. It's going to recurse again. It's going to now call recurse factorial with n equal to 1. And then lastly, again, it's going to call recurse factorial again with n equal to 0. Finally, it gets there, and it returns 1. And it returns 1 because that is the last number we want to multiply our factorial by, right? So again, we want to do 4. If, we were, if n was 4, we would do 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So in the case when n equals to 0, we multiply by 1. We'll, we'll multiply everything else by 1, the rest of the product or the rest of the factorial that we've been building up. OK. So again, that was just kind of walking through uh, an example of a base case as well as how we actually move towards the base case. And now let's let's take a look a bit at and compare uh, recursive implementation versus an iterative implementation. 
So up top, we have the same recursive implementation that we just saw. And then down uh, right below that is an iterative version that uses a loop. Uh, so these both do the same thing. But you'll see that uh, the recursive function is slightly shorter. And there's it's kind of less to have, you have to worry about, right? Because in, we can see in the iterative factorial version, uh, I guess mostly what I'm talking about is the fact that uh, you have to worry about how you're going to set up the for loop. In this case, with this for loop, we have to set up a range that starts at n, goes down to 0, but skips 0, and then steps through it backwards, hence the minus 1 at the end of the range function. So there's a little, it's a little bit more fiddly, I would say, even though other, the rest of it is probably pretty intuitive. But I would, I would, I would, hazard, I would say that uh, the recursive factorial function is actually more elegant because it's a lot easier to read if you just define a function recursively. So that's kind of one of the big trade-offs when it comes to recursive code. Again, this is kind of assuming that you've gotten over the, the mind-bending aspect of recursion itself. Once you've gotten over that, then it's actually, I would say, much easier, not much easier, but it's easier to parse the recursive version of this function than the iterative version. Okay, so let's move on now and talk about how do we actually know when to use recursion, right? Because the important thing here is we're not going to be, able, we're not going to be told, hey, you know, here's a problem, use recursion to solve it. That might happen on occasion, but most of the time it's not going to happen. Most of the time you're going to be given a problem and it, you'll just be prompted to solve it and it'll be your job to figure out how you want to actually solve it. And so recursion is always going to be one candidate and you'll need to kind of learn to pick out which problems are amenable to a recursive solution and then which other ones are not amenable to a recursive solution. Thankfully, this isn't too hard to kind of figure out because a lot of times problems will have certain keywords or certain ways of phrasing things that make it pretty easy to spot out when you can use recursion as a way to solve it. So anytime a problem is asking you to like compute the nth term of something, most of the time that can, uh, you can utilize recursion to solve a problem of that nature or if it asks you to like list the first n terms, you can use recursion there or kind of most tellingly is when it asks you to generate all possible permutations. Uh, that is definitely one of the cases where you're pretty much always going to use recursion anytime you're asked to generate all possible permutations of something. So those are some pretty kind of telling giveaways uh, for you know, when you see a problem or when you see a problem that has these kinds of phrases in it or you know, variations of these phrases, you'll pretty much always want to consider, hey, can I use recursion to solve this particular problem? And then lastly, let's talk a bit about some of the, the pros and cons of recursion. We've gone over some of these already, but uh, and the first one we talked about, or we just mentioned was that recursion is intuitive. Once you get over the mind-bending aspect of how recursion itself works. So again, once you've kind of gotten over that, uh, and you're, you're more experienced and used to reading recursive code, uh, recursive code, generally speaking, I would say is much easier to parse, more intuitive, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing is it's, I would say it's a little cleaner as well. It's again, elegant in the sense that you just define a function in terms of itself over and over again. Again, I would say that that's, that's elegant. Maybe, maybe our uh, definitions of elegant defer, but I think generally speaking, most experienced developers would agree that recursive code is for the most part cleaner. But I think the most important uh, facet of recursion is the fact that it oftentimes gives us a tangible starting point for how to tackle a problem, right? And this is because we know with recursion, we just need to figure out two things. We need to figure out base cases, and we need to figure out how to get to those base cases. And that's pretty much it. Once we have those figured out, 
uh, we essentially have a solution to whatever problem we're looking at, assuming it can be solved with recursion. Again, not every problem can be solved with recursion. But for the ones that can be solved with recursion, again, we just need to figure out base cases, and we need to figure out how to get to those base cases. I'm not saying that's easy, but what I am saying is that uh, solving a problem with recursion, there's a certain framework in order to do that, right? Uh, it's not as, or I would say typically it's not as obvious how we want to go about solving a problem iteratively using loops and stuff like that because there's no real um, established kind of rules for how to go about doing that. But what's nice with recursion is that in a sense there are rules established for it, right? Just, and those rules are the definition of how recursive code works, base cases and how to get to those base cases. So even if some problem, uh, well, so I should say, you know, that, that I would say that's the biggest win of why you should even consider using recursion is because it's oftentimes a very good starting point. And that even if you maybe don't end up using your recursive solution uh, as your final solution for a number of reasons, uh, again, recursion gives you a framework for, for just starting out and being like, okay, here's, here are the things I know I need to figure out so I can go and figure those out, right? It gives us a step, away, it get, takes us a step away from just looking at a problem and being like, oh my gosh, what do I even do here? Because you'll see once you look at that problem and you say, oh, I can use recursion to solve this, then you'd be like, okay, for recursion, I need base cases and I need rules for how to move towards it. And then you can go and figure those out. Okay, uh, and then some cons, of course, we know that initially to, initially uh, recursion can seem very mind bending. Uh, there's not, I wouldn't say there's not really a way around it. it. It just takes some time to kind of get recursion to kind of click in your head, right? But as you kind of spend more time with it, you'll become more and more comfortable and then you'll start to see more of the, uh, the wins or the benefits that come with writing recursive code. And then lastly, it turns out that recursive code is actually not as performant as iterative code. Uh, we'll, we can talk about this in a live lecture, but uh, yeah, this recursive code typically is not as performant. And that partly has to do with the fact that when you're using loops and stuff, you have finer grain control over how many iterations you wanna do. Uh, with recursive code, even though you do have base cases, is not as, fine-grained of, uh, it's not as fine, it doesn't give you as fine-grained control as what you might have with like loops, for example. So that's like one reason. There's a whole bunch more, which we can talk about later. But um, yeah, recursive code, it turns out is actually not as performant. So this is kind of the one, I would say one of the main trade-offs between recursive code. Uh, the bad thing is that it's not performant, but the main win is the fact that it gives you a framework that informs you of how you can start solving a recursive problem.